surprised with the fact that we can actually have a multiple interview and it's fantastic. We're going to take that opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, how are you guys? Very Johnny, well, John. how are you? We spoke how are you? Yeah. Not too bad. A great, a, a great conversation. People, I, I, whenever I, I call John, it, it takes up half of his day. And uh, so, <laughs> I, John, I, I apologize. <laughs> But it was Not at all. It's a so pleasure, Johnny. Uh, it, 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 those telephone conversations are actually podcast material. We, <laughs> uh, Johnny, he phoned up to discuss what we were we would have to discuss and, or plan to discuss in in the evening, and uh, sometimes, well, we almost have a better discussion on the phone before yeah. uh, before we get the podcast. So it's a. Uh, uh, it's great. Uh, we, can, we, can go, we can go places there that we can't talk about here, John. No, and that's brilliant. You know, John, we always say we always say we don't do the Lamborghinis, the champagne, and all of that kind of marketing. What we like to do is to hear the real stories, the real facts. And watchmaking starts from far, far before just designing a watch. It, it is often a philosophy, especially for a watchmaker like yourself that is actually expressing himself when he does watchmaking. No, John, uh, John is, is, it, is that very much your, uh, your approach to watchmaking? Oh, I, absolutely. I, I think that uh, for um, all watchmakers, uh, we're first drawn into, uh, like the celebrities for us are, are uh, after the watches, they're uh, probably all dead <laughs> you know like uh, uh we learned about uh you know the great masters from years past from you know from even centuries past uh we learned about them in college they were inspirational when we're struggling with uh putting together relatively simple things uh or making uh, you know fairly basic components in college and then you get an opportunity to look at an old watch, not even a, a named watch or anything like that, but you'd see these and you'd kind of go, my God, those guys made those watches before there was electricity, before they had any proper illumination, and you have the fit and finish and beauty all there. So I think um, uh, the first motivation, if you talk to any watchmaker, uh, would be uh, to to work on and create pieces inspired by those watches, by those makers. So, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and you know, when you start as well, you, you know, your ambitions don't extend any, um, anywhere past that. You get to a certain point and then something else happens and another opportunity presents itself. But it all starts with the watches and watchmaking. So I have a, the first question would be, I'm going to uh, steal it from one of, our, one of our, our followers. I hope you can see it on the screen. Uh, because you're talking about restoration, and I know how important the work of restoration was for you in terms of being formed as a watchmaker, and also in, the, in, in what you're trying to achieve as a watchmaker. So how did you get started, and what was the initial kickoff for you in your interest in writing watchmaking, and how much restoration was important? If it's not a too big of a question. Well, I suppose uh, going back to the very start, uh, uh, my father uh, he used to repair clocks. It wasn't his profession. He uh, uh, he was a, a compositor in the newspapers by trade, and uh, but he was very. Uh, very handy with his hands and he repaired an awful lot of things. His first watch, uh, uh, he, it was a, a cheap watch uh, when he was a young man and uh, uh, it promptly broke and he took it apart to try and repair it and wrecked it. Uh, so he had a friend who was working in the library and uh, he asked him to try and source as many books on on watch repair or watchmaking or anything like that, uh, which he duly did for years. And uh, so my father uh, devoured as much information as he could about watches and clocks and uh, uh, started repairing other people's clocks. So we grew up in a house where people would bring their clocks to the, to the house. Yeah. And uh, 
go into the back shed where they might wait there for a long time before they were touched because there was quite a volume and it was part time. And uh, once they were repaired, uh, if it was a wall clock, it was hanging on the wall. If it was a mantle clock, it was on any flat surface in the house. So we had clocks everywhere. So uh, I suppose that's the, the genesis of it. And uh, um, I, I was always interested in mechanics. Uh, you know, when you're a kid, you don't see yourself uh, necessarily in the profession that you want to end up in. Uh, but uh, uh, when I was nearing, I, I thought I'd get into engineering or something like that. And uh, my, my father made the suggestion of uh, watchmaking, which kind of, I just didn't see myself in that role. But once he said it, it was like, yes, I, I love watches, you know. And uh, went to the watchmaking school. And, you know, his idea was that I would go to the watchmaking school, learn the skills, and get a good, steady job in Aer Lingus, which is our national airline, uh, as, a, as an instrumentation technician. And when I came back and I said, oh, you know, I started telling him about how much I love the watches and how and everything like that, and I wanted to become a watchmaker, he was actually dismayed <laughs> because he thought, no, this is crazy. Like, uh, uh, in the 1980s, it, it was not seen as a good career to get into. So, but it was, uh, I, I, I was yeah, we discussed, so... Uh, and we discussed this quite a few times, though, Johnny, as well, with uh, our friend Jean-Claude Biver and how, how the beginning of the 80s was slightly tricky in terms of being in love with mechanics. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Of course, uh, uh, when I got into college as well, uh, <laughs> you know, now you get so much information on the internet, but I used to write off masquerading as a client to all these watch companies to get bits of material because anything you'd get from a library about watches or clocks, there would be um, just black and white line drawings. And to actually see watches uh, was really something so uh, when uh, you know you mentioned Jean-Claude Bieler uh, when um, when I was in college this new brand Blanc Bain, new old brand uh, was launched and uh, they were only making mechanical watches and this was revolutionary at the time and of course they made uh, a, and they made a point about about the fact that never in the history they ever produced any uh, quartz watch and they will never do and was that probably the, the key of the success in those days? Like a little bit like now, John, for as uh, anachronistic as mechanical watchmaking may sound for the modern digitalized uh, human, actually uh, mechanical watchmaking has found a, a charm that has probably never had historically. We're seeing the best time for independent watchmakers as ever. And as people like myself and Johnny keep uh, talking about, but uh, we, we really are, we really believe we are we are seeing extraordinary times for that. And, and I think um, something subtle has changed in the past uh, two or three years, uh, whereby uh, independent watchmakers are no longer seen as outliers. Uh, I think uh, I think people have uh, developed a trust that uh, if, you, if you buy an independent watch by the fact, or a watch from an independent, by the fact that it's uh, made by, with a lot of uh, handwork and manual processes, uh, there's a finite amount of watches that you can make in a year, whereas perhaps a big brand, if they, make, if they have a good year, they can really ramp up production the following year to meet a growing demand. And... Um, We've had a, a few situations where there's an oversupply of watches uh, where um, you'd have a boom in watchmaking and the bigger companies, they would use their capacity to produce an awful lot of watches and you would end up with um, a, a, an excess of supply in the system because, of course, it goes to a distributor and then it goes to a shop. Okay. And there's a long period there where... Um, if there's a drop in demand, uh, it's not immediately translated back to the production. Whereas with um, independence, we plod along making the same number of watches the whole time. And uh, in bad times, you know, if we don't get to make watches for ourselves, we tend to work for 
other people or do restoration or do stuff like that. Yeah. And what you end up with almost by accident is uh, an exclusivity that is guaranteed because okay. not many of them are made. And that's, that's this live problem you're facing at the moment. We were discussing with Johnny before. Uh, and actually, Johnny, uh, feel free to get involved as well if you uh, uh, if you want to make. Yeah, sure I, I, this is jo this is John's slot. But I, I do have a question, just based on uh, whenever you were writing off to these uh, watch brands uh, years ago, John, did you get replies? And what what kind of replies did they get? Did you did you receive? Oh well, to be honest, uh, as a, a, an eighteen year old in college, I was. Uh, dear sir, I'd like to buy a watch, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> that, so I was getting catalogs. Uh, I remember, oh, I, should, I think International Watch was the first watch magazine, uh, apart from the British Horological uh, uh, Magazine, British, yeah. British Horological Institute Magazine, uh, which, of course, you know, you, you'd get it once a month and you'd devour it. But there was nothing on, you know, there would only be a very... It was, uh, uh, mainly about historical watches, and uh, yeah. you know, I love wristwatches. Uh, you know, um, uh, I wanted to see more wristwatches, <laughs> and um, uh, so the only way you could get pictures of wristwatches—that's what we're talking about here, folks—was uh, to get catalogues because magazines did not exist. Uh, I was yeah. in, um, I was working in Manchester when I saw, saw the first edition of International Watch. And uh, and that was the first watch magazine I'd ever seen. Yeah, yeah because you, you you would not see watches in Ireland, John, unless you're no. in Grafton Street in Dublin or St Patrick Street in Cork or somewhere like that, or Key Street in Galway. You really weren't going to be see uh, major watch brands or anything like that. I know I certainly didn't. I, I knew they existed. I could see on the advertising on that whatever if it was sport, if it was skiing, or if it was motorsport or things like that. I could see that the brands existed, and occasionally on the Sunday papers there would be a Patek Philippe. That you're you're a reminder that you you never actually own a Patek Philippe. You're only looking after it for the next generation. Yeah. Tell, tell you what, <laughs> sounds, like a, sounds like a bad deal for me. I'd like to if I'm paying for it. I'd like to own. <laughs> It sounds like a trick, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Johnny, for that. And I wanted to reconnect also for those that are not familiar. Sorry. Your audio is on. Yeah, you're, there is a, I can say that the same thing, Pietro. Uh-huh. He didn't call him. Call back later. Anyway. Yeah, because I think Dad's Bluetooth is actually yeah. half. So we'll have to talk yeah. among ourselves here. Okay. <laughs> Are you good? Can you hear me okay? Perfect, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, and I was I was saying John McGonigal is is a name for the insiders uh, mainly. People like Johnny people like myself, and I would like to explain, obviously, uh, talk about the relevance of your work as a, as a restorer first, and then as, as a watchmaker. Um, what, uh, were, you, were you very surprised, John, after all your uh, career, you know, built in, in, in uh, several de decades, when you decided to launch Elon, uh, only a few months down the line, you already oversubscribed, you can't produce uh, for as much you know, as much as clients are, are asking, so fair enough. We are in a very, very good and promising period for independent watchmaking. But I, I thought so in 2015 when I launched the limited edition. But then you get surprised by how big the potential seems to be. Actually, um, I was less surprised than I was when we were with McGonagall watches because when Stephen and I started that. Um, it was in response to uh, or um, commissions by two clients, and um, you know we got to a certain point in the design where like oh let's maybe we should start a brand we've done all this work and 
um, I th it was very, uh, um, we were extremely nervous uh, arriving at the Basel Fair for the first time to show this watch. And when it got a great reception, it was uh, a, a huge relief and I, I guess a surprise. And, you know, um, with Elon, um, I know that from having been involved with McGonagall watches, uh, which is now only Stephen, um, that, it, that was a, a good place to come from because there was already a recognition there. And I was quietly confident that, uh, you know, I could do something. Yeah. Uh, but also, as the design of uh, the HB1 evolved, I was feeling that this was something I could sell. So, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, yeah it's, it was a, a bit of a slow start. And then only very recently, in the past two months or so, it's really kind of exploded. And yeah. that was a surprise uh, and a very welcome one. <laughs> yeah. And it must be... Yeah. It must be obviously a, a big task for you because, uh, um, okay, there is one single reference, which is the HP1 that you've launched, but you give like, a, you know, a proper independent watchmaker, you give the clients and you actually cherish the fact that clients can choose a certain number of personalizations as well and interact with yourself, with, with myself, if we are involved uh, with some of our collectors to create something that is, within the collection B1 will actually be unique. So how important was for you to offer this element and how fastidious or pleasant is it? I, I think it's uh, because each watch is hand finished and there's a lot of hand uh, crafted detail in the watch, it's not very difficult to um, make alterations to personalize uh, a watch and um, uh, I think it's very nice to have that interaction with clients and, uh, you know, because it's, it's kind of a search both by me, but also the client, because very often the client comes with ideas and, um, you know, they mightn't fit with, uh, the plans I have for the watch. Uh, but you know, I can say, listen, I can't do that, but maybe we can do this. And so there's a kind of, a uh, a, a process of working together to find something that yeah. is a bit special get, for me. To get over it's five also so, so nice to hand over a watch and just uh, for the client to feel that they had a part in it too. It's not just something that they're, you know, where everything has been processed and um, thought of and then just delivered. Uh, the, you know, the, the watch will look like it looks because of the input that they've had as well. Absolutely, and that's uh, and that's fantastic. So at the limited edition, we are of course uh, honored to be uh, uh, official retailers for John McGonigal's work and for Elan, and we really enjoyed actually this uh, uh, this uh, how can I say interpretation of the desires of the client to bridge it over to the watchmaker into a understandable information that can be easily managed towards the creation of a piece that is. Uh, is uh, is one to to be to be remembered for sure. And before I don't know if anyone has any questions, feel free. And I'm talking to the audience to post them directly in the comments. I will pass them to John. Uh, I have a I have a long series, but I like uh, I like how the conversation goes uh, uh, smoothly. And also, Johnny, if you want uh, uh, to intervene at, at any time, my question was to John: Do you see yourself today? You have developed. A reputation as w one of the most skilled uh, finishers, decorators, uh, movement uh, decorators. And of course, your HP1 is a reflection of that ability that you have, like very, very few in the world. Do you see yourself as well there, or do you also claim uh, and you're proud of your ability to, to engineer on watch movements um, and, and you know, watchmaking from the orological point of view? Um, well, first of all, as, as a, as a, I suppose I gained my reputation as a finisher, as, as a person who could take uh, projects and make them work. I wouldn't. Uh, uh, I don't come from a micromechanical background, and uh, there are guys out there 
who I see are making watches where they would uh, engineer and, and make uh, every single component in the watch are, are as good as. And um, I'm in, as impressed as the next guy with what they do. And uh, um, uh, with the finishing, there's also an awful lot of guys out there. Like I think over the past few years, uh, uh, there's a raft of young watchmakers who have come to the come to the fore, and uh, I think that there is the the level of finish in that is, is as good as anything I've seen. It's amazing. So I think that there an understanding of um, the importance of finishing because it wasn't always there, um, particularly in the in, in the '90s and early 2000s. I think there is a rush to kind of get complicated watches on the market uh, without necessarily regard for uh, the last bit of finishing or uh, functions that, you know, they, they worked, but they weren't as efficient as they could be and everything like that. And I think it was something I always enjoyed uh, to, um, you know, get it to. Uh, That's a great point, John, because... These days, you really have a feeling that it's not necessarily what you, you, you make. And you know, for example, we just signed with a brand called Horage. Horage, they make a tourbillon made in Switzerland and they price it at 7,000 7, Swiss francs. And of course, yeah. everyone is asking, how can you do that? But the, it's not actually making a tourbillon, but it's the amount of hours that you, you spend into making it in a certain way with a certain level of finishing or if you use or not CNC machines, uh, how, how many hours you spend with, uh, with hand beveling, uh, onglage, et cetera, et cetera. So it's how you make these days because everything is ready available. Even in a larger scale in, in our society, everything is available uh, from the functional point of view. But in terms of how things look and how they're made, the differences can, can be stark. Yeah, because uh, it, it used to be the case, if you wanted to make a watch more special, you'd put another complication on it. And uh, you ended up with, uh, uh, as uh, the watchmaker Richard Miklos, I don't know if you know him, he was one of the great hand, you know, um, independent watchmakers uh, in his day. But uh, uh, he used to refer to um, uh, these super complications as hamburgers, because you'd have layers and layers and layers of mechanics, you know, you could put a perpetual calendar and a minute repeater and your chronograph and, you know, and you could keep going. And um, very often you could lift the dial and the mechanics weren't really nice. And, uh, you know, it was, they, they functioned and everything like that, but it's not necessarily about what it does, it's how it does it and how it looks and how it's made. And if you look at some of the, the, the you know, the top watches that come out now, they're not necessarily very, very complicated watches. Uh, they're just made to an extremely re refined um, uh, level. And I, and I think it's better because, it, you know, rather than having a multitude of complications, I say this in the HB1, there's enough complications on it. It's quite... We're, we're uh, but I, I, I think that when you have an awful lot of components in a watch, it's hard to pick out anything uh, because there's so much there. It's it's busy. Yeah. Whereas uh, some of the watches I really admire now are uh, they. It's almost like writing a sonnet. You know, it's um, it's simple. It's coherent. Uh, and uh, sorry, one sec. Okay. Um, it's um, uh, you know watches have. Uh, a long time ago become pointless as machines that we need, they, they've become something else. They've become expressions, yeah. expressions of their mechanics or art or a combination of both. And, uh, and, and it's, that's... It, it's so interesting. It's like living a different historical period. You're very right. I started in watchmaking when drew dropping watch uh, timepieces were those with a pile of complications that would make the watch, you know, 20, 20 millimeters thick. Whereas now we're living the Dufour, the Azaoka era, where is the simplicity, is the really the how is made. How, and I want to leave, also let Johnny also ask, ask a question about what, how was the Valjoux 88 the perfect canva for you in terms of that balance between 
complicated, but not too much, although it's a, it's a quite complicated movement. And, um, and uh, how was it a great canvas for you to express all your creativity and skills as a, as a finisher and, a, and as a, a watch uh, um, decorator in that respect? Well, um, it kind of dropped into my lap, uh, which was great. And when it did, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it. Uh, I was always an admirer of the, that family of chronographs. Um, from restoring watches uh, and having worked on the likes of the, you know, the, the Rolex Daytonas, uh, old Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, Vacheron Constantin, and then other brands because uh, they had different levels of finish. Like, for instance, it was the Patek Philippe uh, interpretation of the 88 was the probably the top of the pile. And uh, you see it reflected now in auction prices, which are really stratospheric. But I think, uh, yeah. uh, it, it, you know, they did a fabulous job with that watch, you know. And um, so when I got these watches or these mechanisms, uh, sorry, one sec. Okay. Yeah. No, no, carry on. I'm back. <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't check out of my uh, family responsibilities like I should have. <laughs> but um, so uh, um, the the mechanisms I got were unfinished, and for me it was like, oh, this is this is just pure gold. Like I can I can I can decorate. I can get the functions right. I can you know balance the forces, uh, and I can make a beautiful watch. You play, um, but you a few parts as well as you as you've done also it's not just finishing and decorating but you've replaced yeah, a few parts as well uh, but um uh and then uh, um the fact that it was an 88 as well made it interesting because the 88 I, i've never seen an 88 with uh, the uh, mechanism under the dial uh, shown and uh, to be honest, it's of a different standard than the uh, components on the on the movement side. So I've stripped everything and brought up the level of finishing and everything like that. And it was an opportunity for me to really show it in a way it's never been shown before. And uh, um, and um, the I I've always tried with the watches I worked on to produce something that had classical watchmaking in it, but was a bit contemporary as yeah. well. It would, you could look at it and not mistake it for something that was vintage, for instance. But this, uh, this, is, you, one of the things that, this is one of the things that I had mar uh, remarked to Pietro prior to you coming on, was whenever I first saw Ilan HB1, uh, just to, to be blown away by the fact that you could do something so different so unique and so distinctive and yet so beautiful because you could do all those things and it may not be beautiful but to do it to combine all of those elements together and to have something that was original and uh, that we hadn't seen before i just thought it was uh, I, I i marvel at that ability to be able to do something and how many different watches there have been over the years that you can still come up with something new in that tiny confine of a watch case hmm. And it's to create a design language as well uh, is interesting. I, I can see a, a question come up there that's kind of pertinent to, to that. Uh, being Irish and away from Swiss watches, what does it mean to you? It's from uh, Timekeeper KW. Um, yeah. I, it's, it's that, like I was uh, drawn into watches mainly by Swiss watches. And uh, I... I worked in, uh, as a watch repairer for a short while before realizing that I needed to go to Switzerland. So all the time I was drawn into the Swiss way of making watches. And uh, when I came back and, you know, when I started working on my own stuff, um, I had to create a language that wasn't there before because, um, uh, you know, you... you, you you didn't have a long history of Irish watchmaking and anything from Ireland really was inspired by English watchmaking. In fact, it was very, very similar. And um, 
So it's no uh, more than with McGonagall watches. The challenge was to produce something that was subtly Irish, and uh, and, and not uh, not something that would really trade shamelessly on being Irish. You know, it's not a novelty watch. It's it, it's really, it, is, uh, it is John. Uh, um, it is amazing because. Um, uh, this question also inspires me to ask and to uh, elaborate a little bit more, Johnny, if you want to join in as well. We always say with Johnny, it's amazing, this renaissance of independent watchmaking is very much not necessarily Swiss-based, but we, we can see now clearly that there is a watchmaking school you know, in Holland, in Germany, in the US, you know, in, in, in France, uh, in Russia, you name it, in Finland, of course, so, and in that respect, we always say with John, it's, it's, it feels like we're living, you know, a certain artistic period where we can see these masters expressing themselves now, like if we are witnessing history. So, do you feel you will be in the books as, you know, the res responsible, you, your brother, Stephen McDonnell, uh, for the renaissance or for the birth of Irish watchmaking? Do you have a mission in that, in that sense? Do you feel that the Irish touch as something to give to watchmaking that has not been seen by the large public yet? Um, never really thought of it in, uh, in, in, in those terms. Like it, it feels like a, a weight of responsibility has been placed on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, I think uh, the reason why you've all of these different nationalities, all of a sudden making watches, uh, could stem from the fact that anybody who was interested in watches uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, when, and throughout the 90s, um, it, it, there was an opportunity to work in Switzerland on mechanical watches. And a lot of uh, guys from like the, the Gronefels, uh, the, the Finnish watchmakers, you've uh, uh, Stepan and Kari and others, uh, you've, you know, you know, for all the watch brands that are there for, uh, you, you know, uh, guys who worked in Switzerland and then moved back to their respective countries, there are a lot of other watchmakers there as well who, who didn't start watch brands, but like uh, they were drawn to Switzerland because it was where it was all happening. And uh, when they went home, because we all feel the draw of home eventually, uh, you found yourself back at home and you had to improvise and come up with something. And the goal was not necessarily to start a brand for a lot of us, I think. It was just to work on watches, uh, on beautiful watches. And uh, one thing leads to another. And, and you know, the, the most expeditious way of doing that is to make them under your own name. Yeah, uh, because for a long while I, I I made watches for for brands in Switzerland, and uh, uh, when the going was good, it was absolutely fantastic. You'd just get a uh, um, components from Switzerland. You'd have very set delivery dates. You knew exactly how, how what your earnings for the year were and everything like that. But uh, when the last watch is made and when the orders don't come in. You don't have a legacy to fall back on. You, you, nobody knows you made them. Whereas uh, if, if you have a watch brand, um, uh, you, uh, your name gets known and you can, you have a certain security in that. Does that make sense? It's, uh, uh, you're, you're, not, you're not exposed to the vagaries of supply of work to the same extent as you are when you're working anonymously. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I actually think, Pietro, we've said this before, that, you know, that some of the brand, some of the watchmakers that we're seeing uh, emerging over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, at one point, uh, so people like Patek and uh, Antoine de Patek were starting up his brand, and they, they were artisanal watchmakers too. And I think to have your own brand... Is something and we're saying okay not every independent watchmaker is a uh, going to be able to create that kind of a legacy where it's handed down from generation to generation and seen as one of, uh, eventually a grand maison uh others don't want to do that 
But there are brands that we can see. Say, for, I'll, I'll take an example of a recent one that we were working on, Pietro, is Laurent Ferrier. That is like, it's, it's detached from being just the watchmaker. There is a brand, and the son, Christian, I think, is in there now, and he's working on movements. And so there's, there is already the formation of a brand there, as opposed to just uh, in my lifetime type of uh, you know, thing. So I, I, I think that the, the, we are, as, to go back to what you said a few minutes ago, we are unquestionably witnessing a historic period in watchmaking, in traditional watchmaking. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And uh, so, John, we have a, a few questions, John and Johnny, uh, to discuss. Uh, we will try, because I can't believe it's been already 45 minutes. So we we'll try to condense uh, the answers and try to answer as many as we can, uh, if you agree, uh, John. So there is one from uh, uh, Watching My Wrist, who is one of our um, uh, loyal, loyal uh, followers and viewers. Uh, he's asking, uh, any thoughts on uh, GS, so Grand Seiko, case and movement finishing? And just a little parenthesis, I want to say that when, I, yeah, when we discussed about Dufour, uh, Japanese watchmaking has become very, very prominent recently for the very simple but 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 high high level way of interpreting uh, horology. Uh, yeah, do you have any opinion on Grand Seiko? Anything you want to? Explain? Not only Grand Seiko. I saw a Citizen have just brought out a gorgeous watch, and uh, I think uh, the the they share the same uh, hands. Uh, the hands are amazing. You know, they're really substantial, uh, extraordinarily finished. Um, uh, I love the, the simplicity uh, of their, uh, their, their watches aren't flamboyant. Uh, there's a, a real clean uh, simplicity yeah. to them. But the, the, the finish is out of this world. And um, yeah, it's fantastic. You can see... Yeah, uh, I, I remember uh, at the time when Philippe went over to uh, uh, to work with uh, the, the the guys over there. When he when he came back, he was blown away. You know, yeah. he thought that that they were extraordinarily receptive and they really took on board the entire over the top finish thing. And uh, and the, 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 I, I would say that the consistency of finish. Is second to none. Yeah, yeah. John, you want to take the next the next question, perhaps? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, John. So from a uh, Hannah's uh, offer, he's uh, saying, "Hello, John. Great project. What comes after the Vazu eighty eight project? If it's not a secret." Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it's a secret even to me because I, I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I'd rather I know what's on the show. Something. Rather than, uh, you know, when eventually I do come out of the next thing, um, uh, I, I'd rather show it than discuss it. And uh, I think it's yeah. always, you, just, you don't know how, you know, you could be making alterations to it to the very, very end. But also it's, uh, uh, it's if you announce something before you show it, that brings a, another pressure of expectation. Yeah. So, yes. But you're but also it, just embarking on this project anyway. It's just really just started to come to life and um, so you've got uh, two three years of work it's not a one-off model. One model uh there are other I, I have other ideas uh once i settle into this but uh, I, I i will take a breather and just start producing at the moment because uh, uh, so the, fact, the fact that you acquired multiple uh, I don't know if you can if you can say how many Vaju 88 you you have uh, available. It doesn't mean that all of them will be utilized for the HB1, uh, or or does or does it mean that you will use that movement specifically for the HB1 and then move to something else if you have any? I don't, in that? I don't even know because uh, and I'm not, I'm not being uh, awkward about it. I I, I don't know and um, and in a way that's great because uh, if if a, another idea came into my head, I'd do that. You know, uh, it's I, I'm not constrained um, by uh, just the one model. I don't have a formula that's too fixed. In fact, 
um, I I think that uh, there's a certain looseness which allows me to you know change direction a little bit, which I think is necessary for uh, actually making watches for uh, uh, you know clients who like differences and stuff like that. And um, we call it independence, no, John, which is actually the yeah. best thing to have. <laughs> Precisely, exactly. Um, but um, uh, what was I going to say? No, oh, yeah. sorry, had it gone. Yeah, actually, there, my fault, my fault, my fault. What is the what is the process you enjoy the most when uh, you know as being a watchmaker? Um, I suppose the process I enjoy the least would be. Uh, the business end, and uh, there, there can be an awful lot of things that, that pull you away from the bench, and it can be a little frustrating. It's not that I dislike all those tasks; it's that it's it's hard to press ahead because you know I can't just make watches. I have to do all of the other things that um, that are necessary to uh, uh, run a brand but um i i like machining uh i really enjoy that it's uh it's lovely just to see how uh a component emerges from a solid piece of metal uh and uh, it's very very satisfying to do that uh um the, the finishing can be very very soothing you know where you're at the bench and uh finishing um, it can be frustrating sometimes because it doesn't always work out. You can have good days and bad days, and uh, okay, uh, and um, uh, but I think the thing I enjoy the most is the fine tuning, like uh, uh, getting the watch so that uh, you know there's a smoothness everywhere. There's an awful lot of preparation, particularly with that. Uh, uh, complicated watches, as the HP one is, uh, where there's an awful lot of components where you're you're polishing functions, you're doing beveling, you're you're thinning springs, you're doing all that sort of thing. But when you're building it up, when you're putting all of the components into the watch, and you're um, uh, getting each, you're optimizing each function in the watch. Uh, that really is the part where I, I'm, I'm, where it's all coming together, and I'm really enjoying it. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Once again, yeah. we have the last five minutes, and I just want to recap on the fact that we have today John McGonigal, uh, who has just launched his uh, brand Elan Watches, a great success amongst collectors worldwide, and we're trying to 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 unveil and discover a little bit more from his own from his own voice. And I can see there are people uh, viewing us from uh, a bit all over the world. Uh, we are the limited edition, the official retailers for Elan watches, and we try to take part of that load of uh, dealing with uh, collectors and customers around the world in terms of uh, helping John then to, um, uh, to be on his bench as much as possible. And um, yeah, I had... Um... On that point, I'd like to pay tribute to both of you for... Uh, the work you do to explain what we do as independents. And uh, I think uh, we benefit hugely from uh, the, the work that you guys do. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, John and Johnny. <laughs> both. And, and, to, and a hat tip to you, both of you gentlemen as well. Absolutely. It's a, it's a pleasure to be associated with it, really. And uh, to, to, to be, as I say, it, it, it's to me. It does feel like we are in, involved in, uh, even if peripherally or whatever. It's it's history in the making, and it's uh, people who are making watches that, in so long after we're gone, will be celebrated and will be auction stars and things like that. Like you know what I mean? That it's just it's it's incredible for me. It feels like it's a it's a connection actual history in the making so i know you're really comfortable with all that kind of high praise john but that's very <laughs> <laughs> try to take you can please wait i'm gone <laughs> i have a couple of final questions uh john um we can be we can be brief uh, if you can be brave enough to uh, um uh 
to give us an answer because these are the kind of questions where it's very e not easy, but it's very natural to say it's impossible to to choose basically. But let's let's try. Who is who would be your watchmaking mentor today? A watchmaker that you look really as a mentor or as a benchmark in terms of how he does things. Uh, I'm saying contemporary because I don't want to go into the Abraham Louis Breguet and, uh, mm, and the past, right. if you like. So, is there one name that you you feel like I should I should achieve that in your you know in your in your own uh, obviously approach to watchmaking? I, I could mention a good few people to be honest, because uh, you know from the absolute perfection from Philippe Dufour, you look at the work that uh, Grubel Forcey are doing. Vianney, I was lucky enough to work with him for uh, for a short while. It, he's a, he's incredibly inspirational. Um, um, th there are so many, uh, but like uh, the the one person um, is no longer with us, unfortunately. Uh, the one person who uh, kind of embodied everything, I think, was uh, Derek Pratt. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, Derek, uh, he made these extraordinary pocket watches, and he was a, a, a real gentleman, real really humble guy. But like uh, what he did was. Really unbelievable. He worked in his own, uh, but uh, I think his uh, his tour beyond with the with the one second constant force escapement. Uh, I, I don't know if it's been better, really. You know, I think it uh, really addresses so many of the shortcomings of a tour beyond, and it just looks uh, the design is gorgeous. Uh, the entire watch, from the aesthetics of the dial to the case to the aesthetics of the movement to the finish. It's all there, you know, and um, uh, yeah, so uh, Derek. Thank you. Yeah, we, we. Yeah, good answer. Yeah. Completely. Another name that is completely uh, underground, if you like, but uh, deserves a mention uh, much more often than what we even, Johnny and I, with our all our will, uh, can do. Mm. So thank you for doing that. Um, there is a. There's an, a, another man I, I keep mentioning him because he seems to have slipped out of history completely. Uh, Richard Miklos, uh, he made these amazing uh, tourbillons. And I, I urge anybody, uh, if you can locate the book Das Tourbillon or La Tourbillon, he's in there. And uh, along with a lot of other amazing watchmakers. Richard Miklos. Miklos. M I C. I think it's M I C K L O S C H or something like that. Or M I K. L O S C H Richard Richard Uh I, I'm gonna... yeah, we'll be checking that one up. And uh, it's yeah. to see we've got some people from Ireland joining in as well with uh, Watch Fan Man One Hundred. Nice question there. Uh, do you have a retailer in Ireland, John? Or no. do you go to <laughs> Teatro? What? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And. Um, uh. And wonder of watches as well. Hey from Ireland, happy St. Patrick's Day. And uh, the same. Happy uh, St. Patrick's Day to everyone. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, for yeah. Watch Fun Man 100, yeah, I can say we are here. If you value the services that we can give as the limited edition, we offer a, a whole amount of additional services. Uh, we, and um, yeah, if you see that value, of course, feel free to get in touch with us. But of course, um, uh, John is also happy to be in touch uh, with his own collectors on, on his own. So it's completely, obviously, your your call. And it's uh, it, this has been great, John. Uh, look, I had, a, I had a whole pile of questions for you. I've covered probably a third of them. So this calls for another live anytime soon when you are maybe relaxed after delivering the first uh, seven or eight uh, pieces because <laughs> you're uh, you yeah. you struggling to be on the bench as, as much as... Uh, as you can. So, are you are you suffering the entrepreneurial part mixed mixed with the watchmaking, or did, did you find a balance now? Do you feel you found a balance, or is it always a bit of a? No, I, I'm. Uh, I haven't. I, I can't say I have the balance quite yet. And uh, uh, you know, we were discussing just this earlier on, and uh, it's. Uh, I've. Uh, you know, I'm resolved to make a couple of changes to make. Uh, to make working uh, more focused on uh, on Elon and uh, future projects and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, uh, but um, 
uh, I, I think the past few years have been very strange. Uh, uh, and uh, But now that uh, I'm kind of getting into my stride again with the watch brand, uh, it's... Uh, it, it's it's we're heading in the right direction so i'm fantastic. happy to say that fantastic well uh gentlemen to you both have a great st patrick's day although you know in the current environment but uh, nothing better than uh, having something to celebrate at least in your you know in your hand and taking some pressure off all of us and thank you john for your for your time thank you for what you do which is highly inspiring for us uh, for us all and uh, and Johnny, uh, thanks a lot on uh, from from us. There will be more happening with the Watch Press with Johnny this week. We're gonna have our Friday wrap up. I'm sure there will be plenty of things to discuss about and plans to make on this new fact that we can have multiple guests on an Instagram uh, chat, which, yeah. which is a revolution. That, oh. that, that's really cool. I, I, I'm very I'm delighted to see that. Uh, that opens opportunities for other things too. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. Thank okay. You. Listen, thank you guys. Thank you so much for what you do, you guys do again, and have a very happy St. Patrick's Day too. Well, okay. All the best, I guys. Visit last to you, John. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Take care. Is there a way to say Happy St. Patrick's Day in Gaelic that we know of? Oh, it's uh, Law Philip Torek is uh, happy, is uh, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we don't have a greeting. Uh, well, actually, you're going to see a load of texts coming in. We do have a greeting. You just don't know it or you've forgotten it. But like, uh, yeah. um, uh, I, I can't remember. Well, keep, an eye, <laughs> keep an eye on this video because inevitably we have all our viewers scattered around the world. So we get much more views later on when the video is uh, uh, recorded on okay. GTV. So keep an eye in case there are some more questions later on. And uh, we're always happy to come back to, uh, to, to anything our viewers want to, want to know. So that may be one of the questions. Thank you, John. Okay. Johnny, and I'll see you very soon. All the best. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.